Right. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity, the opportunity to hear you live and uh, well, not in 3D, but still in person. And uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's start. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you who have taken your time to uh, be with me. I appreciate it. And I'll hope to, um, to serve you. I've, I've taken these slides and tried to make them a little less geeky um, and maybe a little more clinically relevant. We'll see if I can pass that test. But what I wanted to talk about is, uh, I wanted to talk about ACT, and, um, but I want to put it in a larger context of what I think is happening worldwide to uh, psychotherapy as it links to evidence. Um, evidence-based therapy, I believe, is uh, changing very fast and very fundamentally. I want to say why and to point what the, out what the implications are. Uh, so this is not just about ACT in a way, it's about uh, uh, what's happening in the field. Uh, across the world, people are looking to science to help us decide what kind of care people should receive. That's true in physical medicine and psychiatry and behavioral health. It's true in all of the uh, helping professions involved with uh, mental health care as well. And um, business, industry, sports, every place is looking to evidence. And, you know, we've been on uh, that journey for some time. I'm an old man, and I watched that transition. I mean, I sat in on my first desensitization session in 1960. Seven, which was only a couple of years after the first behavior therapy journal was published. So I know these people, Volpe, all these people I knew, I talked to them, I've seen uh, the trajectory of it. But also what has ha happened in academic psychiatry, which really kind of took over with the rise of DSM, where we thought we'd understand human problems by long lists of syndromes and sub-syndromes. That was a strategy, it wasn't meant to be an end. It was, a, it was a way to get from one thing to another. And it has been very successful in academic medicine sometimes, but not all the time. It was a terrible failure in cancer, for example. And almost anybody who knows the history of cancer care knows that botanizing cancer and naming exactly where the lesions were and what color they were and so forth, proved to be a dead end. Nobody's interested in it anymore because the underlying processes, a small number can give rise to a number of different manifestations or a number of different processes can give rise to the same manifestation. So the whole strategy of five out of nine or four out of seven of signs and symptoms was based on a latent disease model. The idea that underneath the form are etiology, course, and response to treatment that is due to identifiable processes. When we know what they are, then we'll be able to target those. And 40 years in, and in the US having spent many billions of dollars on this, not one single example of a syndrome turning into a disease. Not one, not even schizophrenia, autism, et cetera. And so uh, that's discouraging. For the practitioner, it's also discouraging because you want to be evidence-based, but what you're told is after you diagnose, according to the DSM or the ICD, really the same latent disease model is in both, then you will look at these long lists of evidence-based methods organized around them, I'm very happy that the first, this is the Division 12 list. The first four have to do with ACT on the Division 12 list, uh, but that's just by the alphabet. And frankly, uh, I, that list, like this is an old list, it's from about six years ago. It's about 50% longer now. No practitioner could learn this list. It's impossible. And 
each of them, many of them say, oh, we're for this little syndrome, we're for this little thing. But in fact, cognitive therapy for depression versus cognitive therapy for anxiety is not that different. Or substance use, not that different. Uh, even the physical interventions that we have, I mean, you almost cannot find a disorder that somebody is not using SSRIs for. And so it didn't really uh, yield the kind of progress that we wanted. And academic psychiatry around the world, but the U.S. has been a leader in this, and they spend the most money. I mean, the, the federal government of the U.S., of course, they were borrowing all this money. Trump will drive us into bankruptcy. But um, um, academic psychiatry now has, uh, at least in the U.S., has abandoned that. People don't realize this, but the National Institute on Mental Health 10 years ago basically said, we're no longer going to fund randomized trials focused on DSM syndromes. What we'll focus on are research domain criteria, and now it's changing in other ways. But th the real reason was, is it wasn't leading to real progress. It wasn't giving us functional entities. The disease is a functional entity. It's wonderful if you can find it. Um, and clinicians need functional entities. They don't need just formal descriptions. And so in the NIMH, we went through a period of very largely fo focusing on these research domain criteria. I've listed some of them here. But really, if you dig into what was being funded, all of them, because the, these these are rows and they combine the columns that went from molecules to behavior. And really what the NIMH wanted to fund was uh, research on brain circuits. And so, and not surprising, the head of the NIMH is a neuro uh, uh, scientist. And that, again, uh, that's true even after Insel who created this left. But around the world, we've seen a huge push towards the biomedicalization of human suffering. In North America last year, less than 10% of the people with a mental health problem receive psychotherapy only. 65% receive medications only. And the rest a combination. That's just over a 10 year period, about a 30 to 40% increase in the number receiving medications only. I don't know what it's like in your country, but I'd be surprised if you don't see the change of thinking. Uh, and it's not like this has been enormously su successful. And in fact, in every area of the world, in the developing nations, when you bring the biomedical model into mental health problems, the problems get worse. And so people like Vikram Patel, uh, the person, he's now at Harvard, but he was at India, the a global uh, health uh, psychiatrist, uh, Vikram Patel, you know, the, the developing world is really not so interested in adopting this model because uh, what it has driven is something that I think you'd have a hard time arguing as a public health success. Our young people are almost a standard deviation worse in anxiety and depression worldwide than they were 30 years ago. Our rates of suicide are going up, not down. Uh, our prevention models have failed. Uh, and we really need something different. Um, what uh, process-based work is about, this um, um, uh, attempt to try to uh, change the agenda of evidence-based therapy is going back to the early days of evidence-based therapy and the behavior therapy movement. This is a very famous quote by the late Gordon Paul, a friend, a very good scientist. Uh, you may have seen it, but it was part of what underlay behavior therapy and then cognitive behavior therapy of wanting to know what treatment by whom is most effective for this individual with this problem under what set of circumstances, and how did that happen? Uh, this led to a real focus on methods of treatment. And then, although Gordon wasn't talking about syndromes at the time, very quickly, what specific problem became 
what collection of signs and symptoms. In other words, what syndrome. Uh, and we've kind of run that out, and, beha and cognitive behavior therapy is by far, I think, the most the strongly supported evidence-based psychotherapy. But of course, uh, there's modern forms of psychoanalytic work uh, that is also playing the randomized trial game now and doing a pretty good job, uh, and uh, more humanistic and existential approaches. So it's not just the CBT people. Here's what Stefan and I have been pushing as an alternative question that is more modern, which is what core biopsychosocial process should be targeted with this particular uh, client given their goal in this situation? And how can that biopsychosocial process most efficiently and effectively be changed? You see what's a different change here is the shift from problem to treatment method, problem and situation. Instead, from problem and situation to change process, and then method that targets them. And we think that allows us to assimilate the, uh, the, the evidence and to give us a progressive way forward that is less, amount, uh, less a matter of particular name brand therapies, or even schools of thought, et cetera. I mean, there are such things as philosophical assumptions. There are differences. But we think it's time to move to a process-based focus. Well, why would that matter clinically? Well, here's one thing. If you're a clinician and you know anything about data, you've probably heard this one central finding that everybody knows and nobody believes. They don't believe it applies to them. Uh, so I'll tell you what it is. And it's a 40 year old finding that has been replicated over and over and over. Clinical experience does not predict competence. I mean, think about what that means. It might mean you're wasting your next two hours. Because what you filled your training life with and your work with uh, clients with, surely you do that hoping you're going to get better. I'm sorry to tell you, when you look across the whole field, experience doesn't predict competence. It does predict confidence. And you probably have clinicians down the hall who are very experienced who you will tell you they know everything and they will hold forth in their case conceptualization conferences and they always look very sophisticated. Yeah, but when you actually look at the data, it's not predictive. That doesn't mean that some clinicians aren't better than others. It doesn't mean that some methods are not better than others. Here's what I think it means. We get bad feedback. Because in every other area of life, you probably know Erickson Simon's uh, metric, 10,000 hours on almost anything and you become expert at it. Doesn't matter if it's a violin playing chess, you pick it. 10,000 hours, you'll become expert. 10,000 hours of psychotherapy, you don't become expert. You know better than when you started. Overall, for the whole group, I told you nobody believes it. So when, if you're thinking it doesn't apply to you, fine, but it applies to all of you. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, if I said, I want you to learn how to shoot a basketball through a hoop, and I took you out and I said, you got to shoot 500 times a day. I gave you no instruction how to do it. None. You'd get better at doing it. You'd be better after a month or two months or three months. If you did it, you'd be better. 10,000 hours, you'd be damn good. At least at free throws. You might not be able to dribble or pass, or, but you'd get the ball through the hoop. What if I blindfold you and put earphones in and I say you have to shoot 500 shots a day? You'll be no better a week later, a month later, or 10 months later. It's not going to improve. So... The 10,000 hour rule works in every area when you get good feedback. So what is the proximal feedback of good clinical work? Well, you have clinical praise. Do people stay with you or do they leave? 
changes in signs and symptoms, those all have to be bad forms of feedback. Otherwise, it wouldn't be true that people with a lot of experience are not necessarily any better than beginning therapists. And so here's the great hope of process-based therapy. As I'll say in a minute, processes of change are exactly those functionally important things that do predict long-term outcome that you can see immediately or approximately or soon. And if we bring our clinical behavior under the control of processes of change, it's the psychological equivalent of taking off the blindfolds and starting to shoot the ball as opposed to leaving the blindfolds on. Science can take that blindfold off. And that then, I think, can give you clinical utility for the models that we create. Now, it turns out that ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, or if you're using it outside of mental health, Acceptance and Commitment Training, if it's used with sports or organizations, has two different names, but the same acronym. ACT has from the very beginning, when it started, 82 was the first workshop, so that's what, 37 years ago. It implicitly adopted a process-based model. Why? Because I'm a behavior analyst, that's why. I mean, I'm a rat-running behavior analyst. And that's what that tradition was. Um, it's the essence of this functional, contextual, behavioral tradition. And when the third wave, so-called, hit 15 years ago, I, you know, the usual marker people would make is the 2004 paper, which was my presidential address for the main CBT society in the U.S., ABCT, the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy. It's what I said I was up to. Now, mainstream CBT got a little excited for a while that I was here to burn down the house, desecrate their heroes. Uh, it's not true. And now that I'm working with Stefan, who's kind of Aaron Beck's right-hand guy, uh, people don't believe that anymore. But at the time, because of how it came out through reporters writing excited war stories. And there was a five-page story in Time magazine that cast the third wave as a life and death war between me and Aaron Beck. Well, what do you expect people are going to think? But that was the reporter. That was not me. Here's what I actually said. I said that what we're up to now is an empirical principle-focused underlying principle-focused approach that's, that's sensitive to context and functions of psychological events, not just their form. When I say not just their form, I mean not just the signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms are just things you can see or that people complain of. They're topographies, they're forms, they're not processes, they're not, they're not principles. Um, and that I wanted to put that to seeking the construction of broad and flexible and effective repertoires over an unlimited approach to narrowly defined problems. What I meant by that is I didn't want to just get rid of symptoms of a freaking syndrome. I mean, we have data where people stop having panic attacks, but they no longer go to, but they still don't go to work. Well, what good is that? You know, they still, or, you know, they're no longer depressed, but they don't have relationships. Hello? I mean, people didn't come in saying, please take away my five out of nine or my four out of seven. They said, I want to live a life that's worth living. It was only the scientists who put that on top of people. They weren't asking for that. Even people who are psychotic don't very often don't come in and say, take the voices away until we socialize them, that that's what they have to say, and that's the only thing we'll talk to them about. We don't even talk to them about their friends, their aspirations, their hobbies. Their, you know, we just want to talk to them about their psychotic symptoms. Well, that's not really what they want. They want a life. Anyway, that's what I meant by seeking the construction of broad and flexible repertoires. And oh, by the way, for the clinicians as well as clients. 
because last time I checked, clinicians are people too. And the worst thing that you can be is in a position where you're recommending things to your clients that you know when you have the same problem don't work for you and you wouldn't seek out a therapist who would try to give that to you. And do you know the data on CBT people when they have mental health problems? They don't seek out CBT therapists. That's not true, by the way, with ACT people. They seek out ACT therapists. So something's wrong if when you're in trouble, you do something different. It doesn't lift you up. And never mind your mental health problems. Does it help you work with your colleagues? Does it help you with a, a re reducing burnout, of, you know, avoiding excessive stress, uh, establishing a sense of personal accomplishment? And there's now 10 randomized trials, by the way, showing that ACT training does that for clinicians. That's, um, so. Uh, I think we're ready as a field now, for various reasons, to the move to process-based therapy, which is the idea of focusing on evidence-based processes, I'll say what processes are in a second, that lead to evidence-based procedures, methods, techniques, including things that you don't necessarily call techniques, like the therapeutic relationship, that impact the problem people want to help with and promote their prosperity. Now, PBT, process-based therapy, or PBCBT, if you want to say process-based CBT, is not a new form of therapy. There's not going to be a PBT protocol. That's not going to happen. It's a new agenda for all evidence-based therapies, for all therapeutic models, including ACT and its underlying model of psychological flexibility. And the core idea is instead of uh, one size fits all. Let's look at the evidence-based processes and procedures. Method, you know, metaphorically, it would be like understanding about bricks and doors and windows, and then having models that will help us accomplish the goals that people have. And sometimes you'd use bricks to build a pathway, and sometimes to build a house, and sometimes to build a wall. Depends on what people are trying to do. And so we want. Uh, these elementary principles and processes linked to our overarching models that allow us to accomplish what people want from us. That's the PBT agenda. And science can give that to us. We produced a book, Process-Based CBT. Stefan and I, we're writing articles, a lot, about 10 of them. This is one that's in press, the one on the bottom. I'll mention a little later on. This is a an article that basically begins to point out that about 95% of our research is wrong. I'll tell you that sad story later. Uh, and the future of intervention science. But it's not just Stefan and I, I think you can see it in many areas, the NIMH itself. Somebody says, Everyone's to, everyone wants to feel an expert. It's hard to swallow. I'll give you a way out. I think we can take our science and become expert in a way that's honest and not just puffing ourselves up because the confidence that comes from experience. So here's the kind of thing that I think we want to be able to do. This is an actual client. And these are just the clients, just the things you see. It was vetted through a little group in a process that we do in our process-based therapies things where we take a case, we list out all the things that seem to be relevant. The group works together and they try to create a network. What leads to what, what feeds back on what, et cetera. And so it's worth scanning this. I'm not gonna unpack it now, but I'm gonna return to this case later. So it's kind of a case example. Not in detail, we don't have the time for it, but just you could see a pretty familiar kind of situation. Person with a past abuse history, family history of mental health problems, a difficult relationships with their parent, difficult thoughts like I can't trust people, strong emotional reactions, a lot of uh, anxiety and depression, feelings like feeling out of control, uh, doing things like yelling, fighting, using drugs, cutting, self-injury, uh, pulling away from friends, being confused about what they really want, having problems in school. And then the arrows are sort of what the 
clinician involved in the group when they worked with them thinks uh, uh, sort of what uh, led to what. So let's just file let's just that away, away and we'll come back we'll come to back. I'm getting a little feedback of somebody turned on their mic. I might want to turn it off. Okay. Now here's what we're going to do to try to be able to deal with that kind of complexity. Just the normal complexity you have with the next person who walks in the door. You could create such a network for every client that you have with just a little bit of time. A little bit of thought. You might be wrong, but you'd have some ideas of how to cluster them and what seems to link to what. Um, what I mean by a change process, what we mean, this is the modification of something we put in our um, uh, article in the clinical psychological science, is just the underlying functional sequences that we that lead to the attainment of desirable uh, intermediate and long-term goals, or flipped over that lead to the development of psychopathology. And they should be theory-based, dynamic, progressive, and multi-level. And what we mean by that is just that they're organized around conceptual principles that you can test, so they're theory-based. Dynamic, because these things are involved in feedback loops and nonlinear changes. When one thing happens, it changes how other things function. You know, traumatic events happens. Now it changes how your relationships function, for example. Progressive, meaning that they can lead to long-term improvement. Multi-level, because different processes can supersede others. They're nested into networks. So this is just to get you oriented. You don't have to remember this. But now what do we want from change processes? Well, as I mentioned, they need to be based on a theory. But not just that, they need to be contextually embedded and changeable. If somebody wants to tell me about, you know, big five personality and I say, okay, is it changeable? And they say no. Well, then at best, that's a moderator. That's not a change process. Change processes have to be things you can change. And, and since we're in the context of our clients' lives, we're not them. We can't choose what their behavior is. We can only do things to help them choose or alter what their behavior is. The theory has to tell us how to go from the world without, from context, to the world within. And they have to be able to be shown empirically to relate to these functionally important treatment outcomes, negative or positive. Some change processes may be pathological, some are helpful. Now, I, as a scientist, I come in and say, yeah, and I, I don't want to just have a cacophony of processes. So I want a small number of things that I can say about a given thing. I want my concepts to be precise, but I want them to apply to many things. And I want them to connect across levels of analysis. I never want the brain to be saying something that overt behavior leads you to say something different. They have to fit together scientifically. Over time, it's not immediate, but so we need to, we're part of a larger uh, set of life sciences, you know, up into anthropology, culture, sociology, down into neuroscience, uh, uh, epigenetics, genetics, and so on. Uh, I, because I want to shoot, help clinicians shoot the ball through the hoop, you have to be able to get feedback that's pretty quick. So it has to be able to be taken, these measures of these processes have to be able to be assessed frequently. Ideally, some of them virtually continuously, especially if we could see them in session. And probably if you think about it, you have some ideas about this. If I asked you to think about a case and say, where was a real transformational moment that happened that showed you that this case was going to be a success or a failure, if that's the one you pick, you probably could say something. You'd have some guesses. Science can help with that. And that's the ball through the hoop or not through the hoop. And when you see the ball hit the rim and not go through the hoop, that's good feedback too. Successes and failures. We don't want only successes. We don't learn anything from that. Successes and failures will shape us up. 
So ideally, we want to be able to see those even in the session. And certainly, if we're using self-report or oral swabs of up and down regulation of stress-related genes, you know, we can actually do that now. You can take an epigenomic analysis that show changes within 10-minute conversation with a client. That study has been done. Uh, look at uh, Herb Benson's work on 15 minutes of meditation changing about 2% of your genes through oral swab epigenomic analysis. Okay, so this is aspirational. This is what we want. Uh, but we also need, we have to have not just the change processes, we have to have models of the change processes. Why do we need that? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, we've started to look at all the change processes that are out there. We have a study where we've identified every single psychological intervention. When I say we, this is Joe Sorochi at Australian Catholic University, Stefan Hoffman and his team, of course, uh, at Boston University and my team at the University of Nevada. We've identified every single randomized trial ever done with a wait list or treatment as usual comparison on every psychological intervention ever used that claims to have found a mediational process that predicts its outcome. Why we call it Death Star, this is out of uh, this is Star Wars. Uh, we'll explain, I'll explain in just a second. But it turns out there's 55,174 studies that have made those claims. We're walking through every single one and scoring them. Only about a thousand of them really found uh, mediators. We've scored them all once, and we're now doing the second round of scoring. We have 16,000 more to do. Uh, then we have to categorize them. But uh, this, just to give you a sense of one reason why you need a model. This is just the first quarter of the studies we've done. These are successful mediators. Now, what mediation is, I'll talk in a bit, but in other words, studies that claim to have found a change process that when you change, reliably predicted, not just correlated, but is shown to be functionally important, how it does that, maybe I'll talk about, there's just some geeky statistics underneath it. And I think they're legitimate, kind of. Uh, uh, but it cha claimed to have found a successful cha functional change process in a psychotherapy or other psychological intervention. And you begin to look at this, we're going to end up with, you know, already transdiagnostic processes, you know, ones that have broad applicability. There's about 130 of them the named in the literature. And in our study, we're going to find, the, I, I think we're going to have probably around two, 200 successful mediators, successfully shown to be important processes of change. No clinician can remember those things. It's impossible. And oh, by the way, a bunch of them are just different ways of saying the same thing. Everybody wants his own terms or her own terms so they can be rich and famous and have be on the workshop circuit. Um, so we're going to need a way to simplify that. We need models that will simplify the cacophony and are coherent. They have to fit together. They have to make sense. You can't just do it by throwing everything into the pot the way you might make soup at the end of the week by taking all the leftovers. That's not going to be helpful. Let's see if I'm, I forgot to turn off the, the ringer. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> And they have to be broadly applicable. Why, if we walk away from syndromes and we have so many different problems that people have or areas of prosperity, things they want, you know, relationships that work or effectiveness at work or success in their sports uh, endeavors, whatever, you know, that is such a broad area. We better have a few models that can do a lot because we can't afford as practitioners to have people coming to us and say, oh, I'm sorry, I only work with left-handed, bald, old people who, you know, are 
you know, progression orthodox who, you know, you just can't do it that way. So, and many of these trials, you know, in syndromes, you know, they eliminate people if they have any other comorbidity, so-called comorbidity. Well, that's 65, 70% of the people. So what are you doing? You're working with weirdos. You know, people only have one little pride, you know, come on. And then practitioners don't get to do that. They see the fruit nut seed mix of people with a gazillion different overlapping problems. So we're going to need to have models that are broadly applicable with known treatment utility, meaning that when you use the model, it helps you deal with that breadth in an effective way. And that allows you to do a kind of functional analysis. And what I mean by that, that it can tell you what are the really critical things that you need to intervene on with this person or that person. And it may be different from person to person. Now, of course, this is what we try to do intuitively, clinically all the time. But the scientists are giving us these big, thick books of protocols Worse, they sometimes give you adherence manuals that are thicker than the treatment manuals, and then they shove them in these cubby holes of syndromes, and then people don't show up in those cubby holes. They show up with complexity. And oh, by the way, they don't they sometimes have strengths. You probably have been in a situation where you try to intervene with somebody and they say, Oh yeah, my last therapist did that. And they go like, oh. God, that's my best stuff. <laughs> I'm going to do it again? You know, so in other words, what I'm saying is a new kind of functional analysis, not the old style, just contingency analysis, but looking at uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses from a process focus. And so it's best not to think of what's the best model as if there's only one you know, don't think of it ontologically. And if I ask you here, which is the real map of the house? Well, you know, if you want to know how to get to the party, that one on the left is pretty good. The one on the right's not going to help you at all. If you got a plumbing problem, the one on the right's probably pretty helpful. If you want to recognize the house when you get there, the one in the middle is pretty helpful. So it depends on your goals and what you're trying to do. So don't, there may be many models overlapping even some. That's okay. As long as they're useful and you know what you're getting. Now, why the, the model business is hard. This is, this is difficult. It's not just hard because the scientists fight. It's hard because it takes a lot of time. Now, here I get to do a little bit of self-praise. The first ACT workshop was in 1982. The first randomized trial in 1983 was published in 1986. The next one I published was in 2002. I went 15 years without another randomized trial. The whole field, I only had one or two in that 16 year period. And why? Because I was trying to build the model and work out the processes, work out the measures, even work on philosophy of science. Philosophy of science, why? Because our assumptions matter. And if you're a, a mechanist, you're gonna have a different set of principles and ways of thinking than if you're a contextualist or a formist or an organicist. If your root metaphor is one that we're machines with parts, relations, and forces, that's different than thinking of people as uh, 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 developing organic systems that you're something more like a growing tree but that's different than the thinking of things more like uh, you know a, a nosologist would of what problem do you have you know it's more like recognizing are these sheets of paper or are these uh, piles of bricks so your core I don't have time to deal with that but we if you go into the work underneath act you'll see long <laughs> articles, books, etc., trying to work out our assumptions, our measures, principles, put them in the basic lab, do the research, create a clinical measures, put them into the clinical lab, do component studies. I mean, we've done meta-analyses of component studies. Uh, the one we did several years ago had 65 studies. 
Nobody else can do that. Because I'm, I'm sorry, but maybe someone, but very few. And the reason is because we're doing component studies from the 80s forward because, well, because this process based vision. So it takes time. That's one reason it's hard. You can't just say, hey, I got a model. Uh, no, it's going to take you longer. The other part, why it's hard, this is the horror. The vast amount of our research is wrong. And I'm beginning to realize how much my own research is wrong. I'll tell that story here just uh, right now. Uh, this is a very depressing story. I, I, I just will kind of wave at it. But we have an article, it was back in that slide, if you get the slide set, you'll see it coming out in Behavior Research and Therapy, explaining why if you take a process focus, you're going to need to get interested in ideographic research done with many, 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 many people that are then scaled into nomothetic generalizations. Why? Uh, well, this is a depressing thing I only learned about a couple of years ago. In the physical sciences, there was a time when physicists wanted to be able to model how individual gas molecules behaved under different conditions. And they couldn't measure individual molecules at the time. So they needed to, but they could measure the behavior of volumes of gas. And they could see what happens if you, you know, heat it up or if you change the gravitational uh, or magnetic fields or on and on and on. If you accelerate it, et cetera. I mean, they wanted to know, does this apply to the molecule or only to the collection of molecules we call a volume of gas? And the, they worked out in the mid 30s the mathematical conditions under which you can go from a collective to an individual. It's called the ergodic theorem. That ergodic theorem is based on a set of assumptions. And there are some physical things. For example, there's a few noble gases in which the volume of gas behaves like the molecules. But the principles involved in the mathematics, I encourage you to go back and, and look at it, if you're interested in why this is now having a thundering into process-based work, it only works if all the molecules are identical and all the change trajectories are either absent, in other words, they don't change very much over time, or they're identical. There's no sequence, there's no combination, it's always identical in the same sequence for the same things for all the molecules. Does that sound like your clients? You know, unless you're treating frozen clones, the answer is no. Clients are different, they're not the same, and the change trajectories are different. So why does this matter? Here's why it matters. The randomized trials, looking at the level of the collective, when we say, on average, uh, how many people get better if I do this or that? Okay, maybe you can get away with that. One reason, by the way, that there's this latent disease assumption is the statisticians have known this for a long time. They don't talk about it in a way that where they see how, where you get to see how much of a problem this is. But those, that assumption of homogeneity that you learned about in STAT is linked to the ergodic theorem. And by having this idea that underneath it's all really the same thing because they have the same latent disease allowed us to check off point number one of the agrotic theorem, the one I still have listed there. But it doesn't check off point number two because there's many change processes in the exact sequence. When you know the history of somebody, you may have two people who have panic disorder, but their histories are completely different. How they got there is completely different. Well, that means the processes of change may be different. Okay, I won't go very much beyond that ex except to say what this means. What this means is most of what the clinicians know from science isn't helpful to them. Most, in other words, said, you know, most of what the researchers are doing is not what clinicians really need to know. What a clinician needs to know is what's going on with this person? How did they get there? And how can I change something to get them in a positive state? 
So you take something like mediation. We're doing the analysis of all, whatever it'll end up be, probably about a thousand successful studies of mediation. Every single one, we're gonna do the analysis. But almost all of them have only one or two variables. Do you think your clients' lives are affected by only one or two variables? And oh, by the way, in order for mediation to work, uh, I don't have the time to go into this fully, but you have to assess the mediator before there's any change in the outcome because they have this idea that there can't be any double-headed arrows. It has to be arrows with a head only on one direction. So they can't be recursive. And by the way, the, it has to be linear. It has to be the same across the whole sequence of the client. So now start thinking about this. Change processes that are always linear doesn't matter where they happen. There's only one or two, and they apply to everybody. Uh, that's fantasy. That doesn't exist. So we have an idea of what we're going to do about it. But just to give you a sense, a common sense example of how bizarre our research literature is and how disconnected it is from what practitioners want which is, I think we want to know what are the change processes intuitively. Take the example of errors in typing and speed of typing. Let's say you wanted to know what that relationship was. If you get a large group of people anywhere, go to any city square, any big building, anywhere, get them all in, have them type, and then look at the relationship between speed and errors what you'll find is that some are expert typists, some are hunt and peck typists, very, very poor typists. And what you'll get is there's a correlation, the faster, better typists make fewer errors relative to their productivity on a per word basis. Now take every single person in the group and push them to type faster or type slower and record their errors. Every single person, without an exception, will show you the exact opposite of what every group, without exception, shows you, which is the faster any individual tries to type, the more errors they make. Now think about what this means. We've got all of our studies essentially doing what you do with typing speed and errors, because we're looking at mediation change processes only at the level of the collective, like a volume of gas, and then we're gonna work with individual molecules of gas called your client. But the processes can actually, like the example I've given you, be completely upside down. You can have it be the exact opposite of what is true for everybody longitudinally within their life as opposed to across a whole bunch of people at any one given time. So psychometrics is wrong, group compar uh, comparison designs are wrong, mediation is wrong, I mean, it's just, and by the way, I come out of behavior analysis, which always made this argument, we have to go person by person. And so where Stefan and I are now going are into one at a time complex networks done with hundreds if not thousands of people linked to treatment where you can where you have high density like ecological momentary assessment data that you can put into networks and there are statistical ways of then determining person by person what their particular change processes are and then collecting them if you can you may not be able to into nomothetic groupings into generalizations I'm not gonna do more on that. I'm just saying the journey we're on with process-based therapy is gonna change how we do research in a way that's gonna give practitioners what they really want. And uh, we're gonna have a bit of a, uh, of a transition here, that probably a 10, 20 year transition. I may not live to see it all happen, but. Uh, so where we are now, what can we do with this? Well. Focus on chain processes that have been vetted longitudinally. You don't just want pre-post follow-up. You want higher density, 
ideally at multiple levels. They had actually been looked at ideographically. They're based on basic principles. You can, you can start with people who don't do it, establish it, and see what happens. For example, a kind of bottom-up vision. And then we have decided, this is this Death Star project. You can see now why we call it the Death Star, because it's, if we're right about what we're saying, it's going to blow up the existing research so much that it's, it's like the Death Star blowing up planets in, uh, in Star Wars. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start with what we know about mediation, but then we're also going to try to say, what do we know about longitudinal change processes? And then here's our final idea. What if we took the best established theory of change processes known in the life sciences? There is one. There's one that everyone agrees with. You don't see it very often talked about in terms of psychotherapy. You see it talked about in other contexts. But if you take any biologist, any physician, anybody who's interested in life sciences, and you take any phenomenon, how the cardiovascular system works, or anything, and you, how the brain works, and you take that person and you say, why is that like that? And then whatever question, whatever answer they give you, you say, well, why is that? And then, well, why is that? You'll be about three questions away from the word evolution. Any brain scientist, anybody studying the liver, anyone studying cardiovascular, et cetera, they're gonna say it evolved that way. And they may know, even know something about the evolutionary functions, for example, the history, the course of development, how it develops within the lifetime of the individual, what it can be modified by. So, I've been working for now about 10 years with a major evolutionary biologist, David Sloan Wilson, and with other evolutionary biologists. If you were to come to the main world conference, if you're able to get there uh, for the ACBS group, you know, the ACT group, every year you'll see major evolutionists, people like Eva Jablonka, who's kind of the B.F. Skinner of epigenetics. Um, at the current one, uh, we have a, a wonderful... Uh, a gal out of Stir Sterling University, Christine Caldwell, who does experimental evolutionary work with cultures, with non-human animals and with humans. Anyway, we care about this because it's the best established set of change processes. And I said I'm a behavior analyst, and you may not know that, but behavior analysts have always thought of themselves as evolutionists. So here's what we need. These are just, this is Steve's quick and dirty evolutionary perspective. You only really need six things to be able to, to get the lion's share of what we know about how evolution works. Most of these you know from your biology 101 class. Some of them, maybe not so much. Uh, but one that you would know is variation. If everything's the same, nothing's gonna happen. And with our clients, we know if people always do what they've always done, yeah, well, they'll always get what they've always got. That's a, uh, a phrase that a uh, now dead uh, U.S. Uh, comedian, uh, Moms Mabley, made popular. You have to have variation. So the enemy of change clinically is rigidity. People are really always doing the same thing over and over again, and often they are. They'll come in and ask you, how can I do what I've always done and get a different outcome? Will you help me do the same thing? And that's really, if you unpack, and the answer is no. Uh, it's, and the other thing you have, in the variations, you have to be able to pick successes and failures. Even people who are very disturbed, who are very, very you know, into their suffering, are not always doing things that are unhelpful to their lives. Sometimes they're doing things that are helpful, but they don't always notice it and they don't always know how to build on it. So we gotta have a way of picking success and failure. Now in genetic evolution, it's life and death. In behavioral evolution, evolution within the lifetime, it's, it's other things. We'll talk about that in a second. When you find something that works, how do you retain it? How do you store it? How do you save it? How do you build on it? You better have a way to retain it in genetic evolution, it's through the sequences of nucleotides that define genes and the 
processes of uh, cloning or sexual reproduction. You better be sensitive to context if you're gonna evolve on purpose. Uh, in a parade, wearing a zebra suit, good idea. In a lion park, a uh, bad idea. And so you need to think about what is the context of the person's life and even if they're doing some successful, would it land well in their particular life circumstance and be able to be retained? And then the last two that are sometimes missed is that evolution is multidimensional. We went through a period where genes got so important with the modern synthesis that evolution was defined as nothing more than the frequency of genes, changes in the frequency of genes in a population. That's demonstrably false. Darwin didn't believe that. Of course, he didn't know about genes either. But we now know that, for example, we construct niches that last beyond our lifetimes, that alter how uh, phenotypes are selected, or that we have this is a diagram of what it looks like to hang a methyl group on cytosine and what that does to the ability of RNA to read and then successfully uh, transcribe and produce proteins based on DNA. And methylation, hanging a methyl group on cytosine, is only one of you know, dozens of epigenetic processes, histone bundling, DNA folding, on and on it goes, incredibly complex processes that have evolved to alter how genes are expressed. Essentially, it's a form of evolved evolvability. So what are the dimensions within a system? When we add behavior, we need to think about those dimensions. And then finally, what level? The reason why level is important is, excuse me, success is selected uh, at multiple levels at once. Uh, for example, uh, genes require the success of the entire body to be able to be passed on. But the success of the entire body is based on various things like parenting or uh, you know, uh, avoiding pred predation and so forth, and that's not just genes. Um, if any one level becomes selfish and it's not dampened down by the higher level, then selection reverts to the lower level. So, for example, you've got 37 trillion cells in your body. If any one of them, and it only takes one, becomes a rebel cell and metaphorically decides, of course cells don't decide anything, but it's as if they decide, I just want more of me, well then you have cancer. And your body has ways of detecting that level of selfishness at these smaller units. And if it can't correct it, your body's constantly correcting changes in DNA sequences, weeding things out, uh, killing cells that are rebel cells in the early precancerous stage, or even at the cancer stage, if you don't rein in selfishness at the lower level, it will bring down cooperation at the higher level. We see that too in couples and families, you know, uh, or we see that in uh, behavioral repertoires. If you have part of your repertoire fighting for all of your time and attention, you're not gonna have time and attention for other parts. So that's what I mean by level. We want it to work at all levels of organization and to rein in selfishness that's unhelpful at lower levels of organization. So that's it, the six terms, variation, selection, retention, in context, at the right dimension and level. Uh, that allows you, I think, to apply evolution to evolving on purpose. And why would I do this? Because it may help us organize change processes. Now here are the dimensions so far that have come out of our Death Star project. Affect, cognition, attention, self, motivation, and overt behavior. 
we can find successful change processes in each of these six dimensions in the psychological or behavioral literature. And why those six? Uh, I don't know. It's just what's there. Uh, but it's an, a useful beginning set. Now, if you're a behaviorist, you might say, hey, these are all behavior. I actually would agree with that. But I have a little bit to say about that in a second. In terms of levels, we also find social and cultural factors, social support, therapeutic relationships. Uh, you know, how you interact with your, your family or friends. That's a, 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 not a dimension, that's a different level that nests the psychological level. Or conversely, you can go to smaller levels of physical abilities and disabilities, diet, exercise, and sleep as an example, or brain functioning, epigenetic, genetic factors. When I give this lecture to clinicians, I usually ask how many people ask their clients about diet, exercise, and sleep. And about 80% uh, of the clinicians raise their hand. Well, as I've said a couple times, and as you can see, I'm an old man, and I guarantee you that 30 years ago, that wouldn't be 80%, it'd be something more like 10%. So we've kind of learned to be concerned. Why? Because if people aren't healthy in terms of what they eat or exercise or sleep, we know that that lower level will take down the success at the higher level. Conversely, if you're not able to nest your success as an individual into the things you really care about at the social level, or putting you just into environments, work environments, or so forth that are uh, positive. If you're in an actively abusive environment, you know, life's not going to work well for you. Now, here's a, a little matrix. This is in the Behavior Research and Therapy article that Stefan and I have in press. I put it up earlier, so if you have the slide set, you can find it. We have six dimensions here, the six I mentioned, affect, cognition, attention, self, motivation, and overt behavior. And two levels, I'll leave them on one thing just because I don't want to have a four-dimensional figure, the physiological and social or cultural. And then we have these processes of variation, selection, retention in context. Now, if you are kind of like, ah, variation, selection, I have to learn a whole vocabulary, you're probably okay with these, these rows. But these columns, you may not be. Well, let's just put them in common clinical terms. All I mean by variation is change. How do we create change? All I mean by selection is function. What are the functions of these various things? Uh, all I mean by retention, really, is what am I going to do to build habits and larger patterns that are supportive? By what? By what's in the context. What I mean by context, there we use the term context, but the fit and support. The social support, family support, work environment support, government support, and the fit, the fit with the person's goals. So these columns here, really I could have labeled instead change, function, habit, meaning practice. You don't get habits, you don't repeat and pattern, you don't get habits that don't fit into larger uh, sequences of behavior in your life, and then uh, context and, uh, and support. Uh, so those four columns shouldn't seem too rare to you. Now what we've done is we've gone back, so we're, we've come up with a scoring system, and we've taken all of these mediators from all these different traditions, you know, psychoanalytic, humanistic, existential, behavioral, cognitive, we don't care. And so far, it's very easy for us to sort them into these columns and rows. We have stacks here, maladaptive and adaptive. So usually, you know, most of the writing may be about what you want to produce in therapy and be adaptive. Sometimes in the literature on psychopathology, it's about what's maladaptive. And we can usually sort these out really well. I'm going to link this, we call it the model of models. It's essentially a multi-dimensional, multi-level evolutionary model. 
looking at processes of change psychologically. I don't mean this as another technical vocabulary. Keep the ones you like from your particular tradition. It's just a guide for you to do a kind of step back and look to see, do I have change processes that are broad enough that will cover all these rows and these columns when I need them? Um, now it's worth kind of mentioning how you think of psychopathology from this point of view. I think you start thinking of it as self-sustaining biopsychosocial processes that interfere with healthy forms of evolutionary change. They restrict healthy variation or healthy selection or retention processes. They undermine sensitivity to context. They overemphasize particular dimensions versus others, or they miss the importance of particular levels. I mean, if you take something like drug addiction, let's say, uh, the selection process there is very powerful. Woohoo, this feels good. Yeah, but it interferes with other selection processes, which starts interfering with your ability to create healthier habits. And it, you're overemphasizing certain dimensions, like the physiological rushes that you get, over other dimensions, such as the, uh, you know, the affective range that you can experience or the co your own cognitive flexibility. They may interfere with certain levels, like your wife wants to divorce you now because you're high all the time and spending the family's money on that, and so on. So. You can think of psychopathology this way. It really is a kind of adaptive peak because what's evolving is something unhealthy and what therapy is gonna to try to do is to flip that towards something that's healthy. Um, I'm about to do a little launch into CBS and ACT and what I'm gonna do is briefly describe the CBS tradition, contextual behavioral science tradition that ACT is part of, a little hand-waving at the uh, relational frame theory, a little more on the psychological flexibility model, and then I'm going to come back and fit it into this entire uh, model, which really all of what I've said kind of settles down to this. Uh, focus on change processes that is multidimensional and multi-level and trying to create evidence that allow us to see the maladaptive and adaptive change processes. So before I launch into uh, that, if you have questions that you want to write in the chat box or uh, uh, I'll even stop sharing here, Bartos, if there's anyone who wants to uh, ask me a question, we'll take one. Otherwise, we're going to launch off into another part of the lecture. You mentioned that there is a kind of big heuristic when it comes to assuming that, you know, I've made this 10,000 hours as a clinician, so therefore I'm suddenly this expert and I'm more, uh, my kind of interventions are worth more than someone who's just beginning. But just to turn that around, how much ACT training would you say one needs in order to start even yeah, yeah. Clients, okay. trying to you know, walk in, okay, I know enough now to try and do anything, right? Well, the 10,000 hours comes from Eric, uh, Erickson and Simon, and, uh, Herb Simon won the Nobel in economics, one of the few psychologists who ever did and uh, Anders Ericsson at Florida State, um, who's particularly known for it. Uh, in terms of, there are some data that in a few approaches to treatment, it appears as though amount of training does predict outcomes. Now, fortunately, ACT is one of them. Uh, there was a, a couple of studies. One came out of Evan Foreman's lab at Drexel showing that with eating disorders, trained ACT therapists did better than ones who were, had more minimal training. If you ask the question, how much training does it take to be able to start and to do something reasonable? 
Raimo uh, Lappenleinen in Finland did a study with beginning therapists who received 12 hours of training on CBT and eight hours of training on ACT. It's about as low as you can get. And then they took their first clients and randomly assigned in a sequence which one got CBT, which one got ACT. They did functional analysis with the help of the supervisor using um, uh, Steve Haynes' method. Not Steve Haynes, Steve Haynes is a behavioral assessment guy. And what happened was uh, ACT led to uh, better outcomes. Uh, but the clinicians were not confident and they felt as though it was not helping. <laughs> so I kind of like it because I think it shows that act done badly is still not bad. Um, we also have, we're sitting on 15 studies with self-help, websites, apps, and um, uh, 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 other kind of indirect means randomized trials with ACT, some very large, totaling probably 3,000 patients in those. And it looks as though ACT self-help is reasonably reliably good. The only failures are in prevention trials where, uh, you know, people aren't necessarily interested in change. There's some successful ACT prevention too, but that's difficult. But if people come saying, oh, I really want help, even self-help can be helpful. So what I tell people is this, at the point at which you have the six flexibility processes and you have a little bit of an idea about how to see them, and at least two or three things that you could do to move them, uh, go ahead. And, uh, but I really usually say first, apply it to yourself. And the best way to do that is with a self-help book. I mean, I don't know if it's available in your language, but it, uh, in many languages, you can get either Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life or The Happiness Trap. Uh, get Out of Your Mind has been studied now in three or four randomized trials. Apply it to yourself. If you can get to a workshop, I always want people to do some experiential work with themselves. Why? Because it's based on the psychology of the normal. And last time I checked, therapists are human beings. So if it doesn't apply to you, uh, then why are you going to be good at leaning in and applying it to others. And it uh, turns out that's a, a pretty, you know, it doesn't take long. You can do that with, uh, uh, you know, a month or so of work, a, a workshop maybe. You can get close enough that you're probably would help to people. But uh, if I, you ask the question of, do we have really good evidence that uh, uh, competence links to outcomes um, in ACT, that being able to show that you can detect and move the flexibility processes. The closest that we have is in the Veterans Affairs rollout with several hundred patients where they showed that with training, you could increase competence and you got with training better and better outcomes. Unfortunately, it was part of an effectiveness trial and the exact statistical test you'd want, we've still not been able to get them to do it because they're afraid of using veterans as guinea pigs. And so we don't have to have permission literally to do the statistical analysis, even though they spent all that money uh, training hundreds, if not thousands of clinicians and treating, you know, every single VA or military hospital from the U.S. and the world gets that training. That was uh, decided by the federal government. But uh, I can't give you um, uh, a firm answer, unfortunately, but I don't feel too embarrassed because not many other approaches to psychotherapy can either. But as far as a guide, that's my guide. Apply it to yourself, uh, be able to understand and read the processes and have at least a handful of methods. And then, you know, if you were to join ACBS, for example, probably many of you have, cost $12, if even that's too much, uh, you know, send us a note and we'll find a way to get you in. We do that for people in Iran, for example, in places where they can't even spend their money because of international fights. And um, uh, an enormous amount of resources are there for free once you log in to the site. 
By the way, the only reason it costs $12 is we pay that to Elsevier for the journal. So otherwise, we would say, if you can't afford it, just join for free. We have values-based dues. Pay what you think you can afford based on what it's worth to you. And uh, that's enough. Most people pay $50 or something like that. A um, few crazy people uh, spend hundreds. Um, so, uh, get out of your mind is in Polish, I'm told. It says right there. Yeah, Veterans and Service of the VA. Um, any and other questions? There is also a question from uh, Kuba uh, about okay. mine. Uh, where can we read more on that model of models? Um, maybe in a future article you mentioned. Yeah, the only place it's in print right now is in Behavior Research and Therapy. And then it will be in a book that Stefan and I are producing that unfortunately won't be out until probably around this time next year uh, called Beyond DSM. Uh, and uh, it will be in a, a really kind of grim article that Stefan and I are writing called Rethinking Mediation, if it gets accepted. It's grim because we basically walk through what I just said of showing that we know very little about process because we've ma we made a huge mistake on how to do the research and we're violating the ergodic assumptions of our own stats. So it, we really don't know if what we know about process is what actually known. <laughs> we have results, but they could be upside down, like the typing example. So uh, the only one that's out where you can look at the model of models and think about it is in behavior research and therapy and press. But it's on the earlier slides, so you have the reference. Is it okay if I uh, go back into the latter part of the talk? Bartos, so good? Yep, yep. Uh, I think right. that uh, if somebody else has any questions, please write down them in chat. And when the time comes, I will uh, copy it back again. So Stephen could respond to it. Right. Okay. Um, moving, moving through this, I want to talk a bit about CBS, Contextual Behavioral Science, about acceptance and commitment therapy. A little bit about the behavioral tradition because CBS comes from the behavioral tradition. I know that sometimes it's not a good thing to say because in many parts of the world, the behavioral tradition, the, especially the Skinnerian one, is very much misunderstood and really almost, uh, you know, it's like saying I'm a leper and then wanting to shake hands with people. I mean, people uh, uh, treat it uh, kind of unkindly, but nevertheless, I need to acknowledge it. Uh, and I won't tell you too much about the Skinnerian tradition other than you know, the idea is that air, all human behavior is shaped and maintained by contingencies, not just behavioral contingencies, by essentially by evolutionary processes. Not many people know that Skinner broke with Watson in 1945 and argued that valid observation of private experiences, thoughts, feelings, memories, and bodily sensations are possible and scientifically valid if the observer has a good history of observing and describing. And, and essentially what radical behaviorism was for him was applying behavioral thinking to the scientists themselves. And that was that second paragraph is how he did it. And the effect of that was Watson's prohibit, prohibition against looking within fell apart. Uh, now that's history. Uh, and it's kind of weird that people think of radical behaviorism as extreme forms of Watson when it really overthrew Watson. But the reason why people don't know this, I mean, they, other than the Skinnerians, um, I'll jump ahead. The reason why is that he gave no reason for people to look within because he said, oh, by the way, cognition, what we're doing right now is just socially reinforced behavior that takes training of an audience to do so. There's nothing special about it. Turns out that's wrong. It's empirically wrong. I think we now know that. The behaviorists know it, and not all agree, but most of them do. And the Chomskys and Bowers and Banduras, I knew all these people except Piaget, uh, and some of them are still alive. They're all honorable, smart people, and they're right. 
They're sometimes right for the wrong reason. Uh, but the form, the analysis that Skinner had, he was going to look at these antecedent behavior consequence relationships and the contexts in which they occur, such as these motivational conditions. He has technical terms for everything. They're called establishing operations. But that these were also going along with contingencies of survival, which is how he talked about genetic processes, contingencies of cultural evolution. And so he was an evolutionary psychologist, really, and thought of himself as an evolutionist. His very dying day, his last sentence, was variation and selection will be important to the future of psychology. Um, but uh, he mishandled language. So underneath what happened in those 15 years from the early trials of ACT and early ideas about ACT to the first book on ACT and the first randomized trial in the modern era that I engaged in 16 years later, uh, after three studies, all of which were helpful, two of which I put in the file drawer and published later. I didn't put them in the file drawer because they're failures, but I just wasn't ready. And one we published just so that my first doctoral student, Rob Zell, could get a job. Uh, he had gone and worked with Tim Beck and done a study comparing traditional CBT with ACT in 1984. Uh, ACT did better. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, what happened in there is we worked out a theory of language and cognition, but not just a theory like, oh, I have a theory. It's an active research program with several hundred studies and children who don't uh, show any kind of symbolic language, who don't have a sense of self, who don't know how to reason, who don't get jokes, who can't do metaphors around the world are being helped by relational theorem theory. Uh, this is the silly diddy version of relational frame theory. Learn it in one, drive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. Uh, I can distill RFT down to a very simple idea. What if what is learned by language is not association or contingency in the normal operant or classical conditioning sense? It's not Pavlov's second signal system. It's not Skinner's idea of uh, socially mediated behavior. It's not the neurobiologizing of association when you go to a computer model and imagine that associations are kind of like connections. When SR learning theory failed, those people became, and it failed because that model didn't work, it mostly became modern uh, information processors. But that kind of shifts association as a psychological phenomena to connection as a physical phenomena, like in a computer or like in your brain. That's not the same thing. Um, think about it this way. Suppose you had a big crowd of people and they're all family members. One person walks in and nobody knows who they are, but it turns out they're a distant relative. He shakes a couple person's hands and then uh, people say, oh, who's that? And I say, oh, I don't know. And then they leave. And then it turns out that person has a deadly disease and the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. show up and they say, oh, my goodness, we're going to have to find out. Did who touch? And let's say it's propagated by touch. Who touched that person? Did they shake your hand? If they shook your hand, whose sh hand did you shake? That's, that's association. Association is bringing things directly in contact with each other by time or situation. So occur together in time or in the same situation. Or they're physically similar to events that are brought together. So classical conditioning, operant conditioning, stimulus generalization, it's like that. It would be like the germs on one person's hand going to somebody else's hand and then somebody else's. Okay, another scenario. It's more like how RFT thinks of language. You have the same big crowd. They're all family members. A new person comes in, a distant part of the family, and somebody shouts up, hey, this is uh, Aunt Mabel's uh, son. And everybody knows Aunt Mabel. If I had 400 people in the room, I now have established thousands of different relations. We even call our relatives our relations in English. Yeah? 
And if you knew how you related to everybody in that room, and if you knew Aunt Mabel, and then you knew that's Aunt Mabel's son, you would know your relation to that person. That's how language works. Language works is training relation. And it started with the interchange between speakers and listeners. If you want a dividing line, learn it in one, drive it in two, it would be something like if you held up an apple and said the word apple, and then take that 12-month-old baby, let's say, that you've done that repeatedly to, and now say the word apple, the 12-month-old baby will look for the apple. They learned it in one, they derived it in two. It takes a few trainings for that to happen. But if that's, now you might think, that's just backward association. Well, if it's back, Backward dissociation is very weak. If you go out to two or three steps, a backward of a backward of a backward, it's absent. That's why SR learning theory collapsed. That's why the modern cognitive revolution happened. You needed an alternative. Association didn't work. We've tried for 300 years to make it work. But relation is different. If you know that Fred is Mabel's uh, son, then with equal force and equal certainty, you know that Mabel is Fred's mother. And so backward doesn't apply to relations. Uh, same, different, opposite. In combination, same thing with the, all the people in that room worked out how they're related to that, grand, to that son of uh, Mabel. It would be at the same level of certainty if it's accurate as knowing how they're related to their own parents. And so derived relations are as powerful as trained relations when they're relations, not association. So could you learn that? I think we can. You can show with the underlying neurobiological evidence that, for example, a child, once they get how to do this, we call it frame of coordination, when they hear the word apple, their brain lights up as if you trained them Name Apple, look at the Apple. It's at that level of strength. It's identical in evoke potential work and in fMRI work to train experiences. Now, that's wonderful. That's great. But just like your example, my example I used with 500 people in a room, all of whom now know how they're related to Fred, let's say, Mabel's son. Uh, if you do the math on relations, I've done it on, if you had eight things related to eight symbols in eight different ways, you'd have 4,000 derived relations from those eight things. If I ask you, how many things could you relate to your experiences verbally or cognitively or symbolically? Symbol is a good word in English. It means thrown back as the same. Ball from the word and eventually goes to bowling. It's throwing something sim, meaning similar or the same. Uh, even in the etymology of our own words for reference, uh, even the word reference, uh, the past participle in, uh, in, in English is related to the Latin word for relation. We've known that relation is at the center, but we haven't had a psychological model for it. But uh, back to on point, how many derived relations are possible between all of your experiences in your life symbolically if everything can relate to everything? When you try to do the math, you come up with answers that are more like more than there are molecules in the universe. I've actually tried to do it, make some reasonable assumptions. You might as well just say infinite, you might as well. Uh, the example I use when I'm trying to understand, explain this to clients or people in workshops, I'll say, think of a noun, and I'll think of another noun. Now, I'm going to give you a weird relation called is the father of. You don't hear that relation very often in normal speech, only in, when you're talking about family. But what was the first thing you thought of? And the person says, uh, a tennis ball. And, uh, okay. What was the second thing you thought of? Uh, a car. I say, okay, how is a tennis ball the, the father of a car? I just made it up, so you all have to think about it. I bet you somebody in here could come up with an answer. 
Let's see. If you throw it really far, you might need a vehicle to go get it. I don't know. You'd come up with something. And so if everything relates to everything in all possible ways, which is the point, this is an RFT book, how are you going to clean up that cognitive ecology when people have thoughts like, deep down there's something wrong with me, or really I want to murder everybody, or, uh, you know, I'm loathsome, or, I mean, you just listen to what your clients are saying. It's like, if you try to clean up their thoughts, it's like trying to clean up a spider web. You just get all wrapped around them. But there's this last part, change what they do. Here's the basic idea in behavioral thinking. Everything is contextually bound, antecedent behavior content, consequence. If you have one behavior, let's call it, just for now, call it behavior. Let's say like a thought that relates to a behavior, like thinking that you're the worst of the worst, lowest of the low, led you to avoid people. Those are behavior, behavior relationship. Well, what we need to do in a contextual approach is to think about what is the context that causes that relationship. And that's back to this idea, change what they do. So I may not be able to remove the thought that there's something wrong with you, but can I change how that thought functions in a system? That's what gives rise to the weird things that we do in ACT, is that we're constantly looking at what is the context for this aspect of action, this aspect of action, and what glues them together. And can we modify how they're glued together? So, for example, something like experiential avoidance. Experiential avoidance is like glue. If I give you some painful emotion, you're going to engage in behaviors to diminish it or eliminate it. So the behavior is linked to the emotion, but it's linked because of a context, a history, an agenda, a purpose. There's different words we have for it. Uh, and that contextual process is experiential avoidance or cognitive fusion or the other ones that are in the ACT model. So think about it this way. We start out with all of these kind of various processes over here in this circle of social and cultural and physical and genetic learned processes and stuff. And then this weird thing happens. Probably older than Homo sapiens. It's not older than our common ancestor with chimpanzees because chimpanzees do not show the most basic forms of arbitrary relational learning. They show only non-arbitrary relational learning. Uh, if you ask a chimpanzee, where's the apple, until you train it, they may have the name for the apple, the chip or the gesture, depending on which lab, you know. I, my department is where Washoe the chimp was, Alan and Trixie Gardner, if you ever heard of them, the sign languaging chimps. But if you're in Amri, you know, it might be her uh, terraces or Sue Savage Rumbaugh's chimps with plastic chips or other things. Uh, they don't show the two-way street. 12-month-old babies do. They learn. Uh, now, why they do, I, I have an account of that that's evolutionary, but they learn what we call relational operants. The thing that's weird about relational operants, about learning to relate, is it operates back on these processes. It busts them up. Let me I'll give you an example of what I mean by it operating back. Um, if you, let's say, had been shocked in the presence of something and you showed classical conditioning, but you had been told that something else is even bigger than that, and you had no history of ever being shocked with that, when that other thing showed up, like let's say I'm 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 uh, uh, sh in, in American coinage. If I'm uh, you know shocking you in the presence of a penny, and then I say, but a dime is even bigger, and then the dime shows up, you will sweat more than you did to the event you're actually trained to fear. 
you'll have more sweating to the dime than you did to the penny. That's weird. There's no classical conditioning process like that. It's not stimulus generalization. Um, because of, you know, if I showed you something even bigger, like I've done it with a nickel, and then I showed you a, uh, a penny, let's say, it, it would be small, a dime would be bigger. So it, it breaks free of physical form. Enough of that. It, there's hundreds of studies. If you get interested in ACT, you'll eventually be interested in relational frames and what you can do with it, like implicit cognition measurement, really good science about how to do things like present a sense of self that has uh, soothing and helpful effects on emotional pain, some really nice changes that are happening in ACT because of what's happening in RFT. But back to this point, we have this nonverbal circle over here on the left, this verbal symbolic thing emerges, we think from contingencies based on the kind of social monkey we are, we think it actually happens based on uh, these social processes between speakers and listeners. But it begins to break up, we begin to have language about what we remember, you know, what uh, we feel, what we think, what we're attending to, who are we, what do we want to do. And so you get these dimensions of experience falling out and really being partitioned by language. But what we're going to want to do is, since we're always thinking back here in terms of the things that glue behavioral things together are context, we're always going to want, when we get off into things like this, be thinking about how we can modify the impact of emotions, cognitions, attention, sense of self, motivation, overt behavior, and all these little, I won't unpack them here, you can look at the slide set, all these methods that we have in CBT and ACT can fit into this larger approach. Um, I'll skip that. Now I want to go to the ACT model. You probably came here wanting more obvious things about ACT. I'm going to present it in a way that's as generic as we can get for a reason I'll explain. This is now kind of a the CBT friendly ACT model. We're interested in cognitive flexibility. Now in ACT we call that diffusion. If you don't know that word, it's okay. We're interested in cognitive flexibility. We're not so interested in don't think that, think this. We're thinking in the, we're interested in the ability to think flexibly and pick the ones that work best given the goal. We try to broaden the depth, the range of emotional flexibility so that you can feel on purpose broadly, intensely when it's useful. Uh, these are variation processes, especially, because the emotional and cognitive rigidity are the single biggest enemy of variability in human functioning. Uh, experiential avoidance and following rules excessively literally are huge enemies of variation. But then we're gonna wanna also attach uh, fashion attentional flexibility contacting the world in a way that allows you to focus or broaden, to shift or to stay. And we're gonna do it from a conscious point of view, from your perspective taking, awareness, I here now, I'm in this situation, uh, which is the capacity for conscious perspective taking. And what that allows you to do is to situate what you do in context, in the context of the world within and the world without that you can notice what's of importance within and without and do so consciously. And then we're going to need selection criteria, intrinsic meaning. What am I up to? What am I trying to produce? And to be able to do that in a flexible, fluid, and voluntary way. And behavioral flexibility linked to meaning that allows me to build out habits of values-based action. That's how you retain things, practice and pattern linked to selection criteria of importance. Now, if you want these six in the normal act way, starting from the left, cognitive flexibility is diffusion. Emotional flexibility is acceptance. 
Attentional flexibility is flexible contact with the now. Flexible perspective taking is this transcendent sense of self, of the observer self. Intrinsic meaning by choice is values. Behavioral flexibility is the capacity to commit to building values-based patterns or committed action. And the name for that, all six of those going together is psychological flexibility. If you flip it the other way, it, you can just add inflexibility to everything or the technical names of fusion, going around, starting from the bottom left, fusion, experiential avoidance, potential rigidity, uh, uh, avoidant persistence or absence of values, uh, impulsivity or, or uh, uh, rigid uh, behavior and uh, the conceptualized self going around the six. Now coming back to this, I said, you're gonna want a model it needs to look at change processes. Unfortunately, we still are working out how many. You know, we do have 40 uh, trials of mediation in ACT. We have a lot of component studies. We're farther along than most approaches. But we also can come back to our evolutionary guide. The affective dimension is this dimension of acceptance or avoidance, cognitive or diffusion or fusion, attention, flexible contact with the now, self, uh, this observing self versus conceptual and self, motivation, uh, values versus uh, achievement, social approval, things of that kind, uh, overt behavioral, uh, chaotic, impulsive, or rigid versus values-based habits. These bottom two, frankly, the act community needs to work on these more. You can socially extend all of the flexibility processes. Acceptance, when you extend it, become, looks like compassion. Cognitive flexibility, when you extend it, looks like the capacity to take in differing opinions and to consider them. Um, sense of self is something more like belonging and connection, uh, and so on. Uh, the physiological side, uh, you know, is, is there in the underlying neurobiological work and genetic and epigenetic work. For example, we have pretty interesting data right now that the, uh, the 5-HTT uh, serotonin transport gene, uh, the so-called depression gene, uh, the endophenotype for that is experiential avoidance. I can't walk you through that, but I'm just uh, Andy Gloucester's study on a, a very nice uh, sample out of uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, is a place to look. Um, but so we're working out the underlying neurobiology of these processes, and I do think we've got a long way to go on that. But now, but let's give me a practice ex practical example. You remember that one I gave earlier? This is the exact same one. I've colored them. What you're looking for when you think about processes, you especially are looking for things that are self-amplifying because they can become disconnected from a system. And so you notice the red ones. Each red one is linked to the red one in a, in a loop. That's bad. You don't want that uh, because uh, if one feeds the other, feeds the other, feeds the other, this thing can be a kind of an adaptive peak. When people do things to help avoid feelings, they feel better. Yeah, but then your life starts feeling more out of control, which produces even more emotional pain, and then you do more of it. So this is like the drug addiction example, or cutting, or... But then there's other ones that are kind of amplifying loops. Look at the green ones. The green ones link into the toxic red ones also in a long self-amplifying loop that goes all the way around to that bottom arrow. of uh, And there, I think it looks like fusion. I'm useless. Nobody cares about me. And then you start uh, pulling away from your friends, and then your life starts feeling as though it's out of control, not what you want. That connects in not only to the experiential avoidance loop. By the way, I didn't create this network to try to show this. This network was given to me by 
uh, someone else who did a as part of a PBT workshop, and they didn't do what I'm doing right now. Um, but you can see the recursive processes involve the green ones too. There's another recursive process around, uh, you know, maybe I, I don't really care. I don't even know what it makes. I just want to be happy. And then school problems, uh, you know, and then leading to avoidance. Over here, the blue ones, I think those are more like moderators in history that help make sense of why these two, rather these three uh, change process loops emerge for that person. Why would you want to go through this? Well, it's a kind of functional analysis. But now here we know we have techniques for reducing experiential avoidance. We have techniques for increasing a sense of chosen meaning or for reducing the behavioral domination of thoughts through what we call fusion. Which of these should we start with? And well, I don't know. I mean, it, there we need to know how strong are these processes. You might wanna start with one that's easier to change. So I'll just give you an example. Suppose somebody really has a, a pretty close to being able to think through what their values are, what really matters to them. Maybe a conversation about values would, would change a process in which when we have school problems, we're not off into meaninglessness, but instead we're able to channel it back into a meaningful action. Maybe that would chip away at the central big uh, red uh, avoidance piece. Conversely, maybe that's not important enough. Maybe there's so many problems from cutting or drugs, I'm gonna go right in there and maybe notice the values violation or something. So we're gonna have to probably get to each of these three processes of fusion, experiential avoidance, and the values piece. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule. We have done a study where we only do the left side of the hexagon. So the sense of self, flexible attention, diffusion, and acceptance. Or we only do the center and right, sense of self, present, why? Because you're always conscious in the moment. Didn't think we could leave that. And then we did values work and committed action. It's published in Behavior Research and Therapy. Jen Vallott is the main researcher. You can also find it through my name. And it turns out that uh, it's helpful to cover all of the flexibility processes. I think because, you know, if I'm right, that this is really kind of a generic model it's because it covers all of the rows, maybe not necessarily the levels, and all of the columns. And that's what you want. Whatever model you want, this will give you a sense, you know, if you have your self-compassion model or your traditional CBT model, you name it, does it cover the rows and columns? Um, I'm at a point where I can just talk a little bit about the grand scheme. Let me just wave my hand at it. I think if PBT is right, remember, it's not a, a therapy. It's a model of therapies, a model of evidence-based therapies, that we're going to see a decline of these technologically defined protocols. I hope so, because there's yet another one almost every day. A decline of general schools. When you start getting down to processes, people can talk to each other. Yeah, you have different names. You measure it differently. But that's fine. I think, uh, of course, mediation, complex networks, and new forms of functional analysis. We're realizing that the ideographic level is really important. One of the things that says, in order to really do process-based therapy, we're probably going to have to get the clinicians involved in doing the research, at least connecting, collecting the high-density ecological momentary assessment data or whatever that gets fed into thousands of complex network analyses person by person so that we can identify patterns that are common enough that we need a special uh, discussion about that, about how to change them. We're gonna have to link uh, processes, these modifiable elements. I think we can do it with things like this because we have a range of diffusion methods, experiential avoidance methods, values-based methods, so we've already done some of the hard work. That's what those component analyses studies are. 
Um, context keeps coming up, so the issue of culture and so forth has got to be more important, which really says one reason why this little webinar is important. Everyone's voice matters, and uh, cultures and societies that have not been as central in the development of the science story needs to be, uh, the doors need to be opened and brought in because people bring particular things. Um, these other ones, deliveries of care, I've mentioned. Uh, the therapeutic relationship, I want to mention that just because here's a very, very quick way to do it. I can do it in one minute in the, the nine minutes we got left. If you think of somebody who really powerfully lifted you up in your life, anyone, sister, brother, mother, father, therapist, coach, a spiritual leader, anyone, did you feel accepted for who you are by that person? Were you constantly being judged by them, or is that far away? When they were with you, were they with you consciously? Could you tell that they were aware of you as a conscious person, and were they able to attend to you, or they were constantly looking at their watch, like, I got someplace else to go. This is not so important. Did your values matter to that person, or would they ride over what you really cared about easily without a second thought? And could the two of you be together in ways that fit the situation and the opportunities that provided? Those are the six flexibility questions. I just walked around the hexagon. So here's my point. Why would your clients be any different? If, if you want to empower your clients, you went them when they get asked that question, you know, how did you feel working with that clinician? to feel profoundly accepted, not judged, consciously present with a conscious human being where their values mattered and you could be together in ways that fit the purposes of your gathering. That's what therapy is. So I, I'm not surprised that the therapeutic relationship is important to outcomes. I think it's because it models, supports, and instigates psychological flexibility. And when you pick an empowering relationship, you do that implicitly. Not because you know the ACT model, but because this is how human beings work. Um, anyway, uh, so I think it's the next step. It requires more work on models, but frankly, ACT and the flexibility model is arguably the best we've got right now. We've done more work on it, more errors than anywhere else. I probably wouldn't say this in front of my colleague, Stefan Hoffman. He got, might get a little nervous feel as though I'm attacking the uh, traditional CBTers, but frankly, we've got more studies on process components, basic accounts. I mean, traditional CBT doesn't have a whole gigantic basic literature on cognition. They don't have people in the basement doing the RFT work like we do. So uh, I think we've been playing this game for a long time because it's implicit in the behavior analysis approach. And, um, but to prosper, we're going to have to continue to develop our model and show that it's broadly useful and that it can use a variety of methods, not just classic ACT ones. Uh, I expect it to succeed on that. I'd be surprised if ACT doesn't become more central uh, to psychotherapy and behavior change around the world over the next uh, 10, 20 years. And, uh, but there will be, uh, I think it'll be uh, broader. I think we, we can do things like cognitive reappraisal in the service of cognitive flexibility. We can do things that come out of other traditions uh, and just use psychological flexibility and evolution science as a place to start. So that's my talk and I'm going to go back to where I was. Let's see if I can get the general screen. Oh golly. Stop share. Okay. So in our five minutes, if anyone has any questions. Oh, the process-based therapy book. It's, so, it's sold by, these are questions. It's sold by uh, New Harbinger Publications. It can be used as a text. I don't know how to order in your particular country, though. But they have distributors around the world. So uh, the former questions were, uh, so can we use ACT also with people with substance use disorder? And if yes, uh, should we focus on any 
particular process and is abstinence required? Yeah, I think so. The answer is yes. There's about 25 to 40 trials of substance use. Uh, some of them pretty good in showing that we can meet or beat existing uh, technologies and approaches. And in terms of processes of change, I think we're doing quite well. Uh, the main difference is that if you're using really good experiential avoidance methods, if you've got a heroin addict, they've got the best technology for avoiding feelings ever invented. You know, you probably want to start with values. You know, as Kelly Wilson says, you know, the authors of the original ACT book were not exactly mental stars of uh, health, you know, had a panic disorder. Kelly was a, a heroin addict in recovery. Um, you know, he says it's not surprising uh, that drug use persists. It's surprising that anyone ever stops. There's no, there's no animal model of 12 step. You know, there's no monkey junkies who are, who stop pushing the bar, you know, if it's there, it's used. So why would you stop? Well, because of your values. So usually with substance use, you come in with values. You have to be careful not to shame and blame. You have to make careful. It's really, it's sort of more like motivational interviewing, that kind of really open questions and then out of that begin to detect how uh, these substances have actually i usually just tell people substance you know if you do what i'm asking here's what i can guarantee you're going to feel a lot worse but over time you're going to live a lot better and we'll handle feeling a lot worse but initially this isn't going to be happy happy joy joy you're going to face some things that you know the chaos that you produced in the lives of the family members you love and what you've done to your physical body. And it's not going to be a pretty picture. If you want happy, smiley face buttons, uh, I suggest staying on drugs because uh, the alternative is a much more difficult path. But it's also a path where you get to love and have children and, and care and contribute. So, uh, And there's entire books on Act for Substance Abuse. And uh, I wrote one of them or edited one of them. They're, uh, they're out there. I see another one um, of the diagram of the triflex. The triflex, you know, you can think pillars or, po or points. If you do, uh, you know, psychometrics work on processes of change, you can identify all six, but they kind of go in the three columns. Uh, uh, that has been done in chronic pain pretty well. And so I don't think of these things as sort of rigid. They're like sides of a box. You know, if you, if, if you said, which one is the box? You'd say, well, they're kind of all together, you know? Yeah. But uh, it's fine to talk about just three main processes, but you're gonna need the methods of diffusion and acceptance or of attentional flexibility and sense of self or values and committed action. Kuba, you wanted to ask? Um, okay, uh, can you hear me? I yep. can, yes. First of all, I'm very, very happy that you agreed to take uh, part in this webinar and thank you, thank you very much Bartek, that you sure. organized it and that you were the, the, the motor behind it. Uh, also, uh, I'm very honored to, to speak with you, Stephen. Uh, I feel kind of uh, starstruck. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, but uh, I wanted to ask about something that uh, Bartek uh, often mentioned uh, when we spoke privately, that he has the sense that uh, the clinical branch of RFT will be the, the, the driving force behind uh, the changes that may happen to act, and the yeah. also mentioned, uh, pardon? Yeah, is that the question? Uh, no, no. Yeah, the question is because you also mentioned that uh, that some things, some findings that were uh, that that uh, showed up from uh, from uh, clinical RFT and from the basic research on RFT may have some uh, some impact of how act will maybe change and i the question is uh, what exactly do you meant by 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 that and 
what changes can we see in act and, and well you know i mean um yeah sometimes people get a little bit too rigid on this of thinking oh if it's not from rft it's no good you know i mean i excuse me i had a role in developing rft in fact it was my idea and so <laughs> i get a little cranky with people wagging fingers at me about rft but in the history of science when you have a basic account you know it if it's good it keeps feeding new things up and so i'm excited by the fact that clinicians are beginning to learn it and use it with Mathieu Villette and Jen Villette i've even written a book about how to apply rft principles directly and i've eliminated it's called mastering the clinical conversation and we went to war with the publisher to not put any act in it whatsoever which was really hard because they knew it would sell more books if we said this is just a different flavor of act. Uh, examples, there have been many examples of RFT even early on and then later on changing how we do act. A good example is sense of self. In the early act work, there were multiple metaphors used around sense of self. Like, for example, thinking of yourself like a house with furniture in it. Or, in other metaphors of thinking of yourself like an observer watching something. Well, an observer watching something that could be thought of as a frame of distinction. A house with furniture could be thought of as a relational frame of hierarchy. Uh, it's been shown that both of these are helpful. There's a brand new study saying that maybe hierarchy is even more important than distinction. So that will inform how we use uh, metaphors around sense of self. And they, I'm really buoyed up by the fact that they were in ACT early on. We had that intuitive sense, but we didn't have the frame for it. And now that we're getting the basic work, we're going to be able to. Another one is motivation. I think we're going to, I think I, because I was very much a, more of a basic behavior analyst when I developed RFT, I was too glib about just saying, uh, oh, these are verbal reinforcers. Uh, yeah, they could select behavior, but they're not that. I think we're going to have to start talking about things like contingencies of meaning. And if you know the really recent uh, RFT work being done out of Ghent, for example, the work on the MDML, for those who don't know it, I'm sorry, it's too complex to explain now. but uh, fit with where I think we need to go about really looking at how language alters the meaning of events and not too easily saying things like, oh, that's just a verbal discriminative stimulus. No, it's not, because a discriminative stimulus is one where you have a history of differential reinforcement for behaving one way versus another in a particular stimulus situation. When you think about something verbally and it changes how stimuli function as antecedents, that's not the same thing. And it's a mistake. I think I made that mistake, not because I didn't know that it was different, but because by using language that was similar enough that the behaviorist wouldn't just die, uh, you know, uh, I could use reinforcement language, you know, discriminative control language. I may have slowed us down for where we are now. So I'm busy actually writing a, a paper on contingencies of meaning and what we've learned in RFTs that, that suggests that, no, this is a really new evolutionary stream that emerged in the same way that epigenetics emerged from genetics, but then operated back on genetics symbolic relations emerge from contingency principles but it's operated back on them and now needs its own language and frankly when like we do that you find the humanists are there the existentialists are there and the cognitists are there but it isn't like we're just repeating what's already been found because now we come with our basic science history and so we can speak to people who really care about meaning and purpose to the logotherapy people or the gestalt people or you name it, the existentialists, and have something really profound and important to say that comes out of Western science. So, um, so if you're interested in clinical RFT, I, I applaud and I say, me too. And But I do slow down when people are saying, ah, flexibility, it's all this middle level terms, there's a bunch of blah, blah, blah. No, that's not fair. It's been too useful to too many people. 
And frankly, if RFT can't explain fusion, uh, I know I'm a bit long, but just one, I know this turning a diatribe, but very short. Uh, diffusion, you know, say, well, what's the RFT account? There's this RFT principle called transformation of stimulus functions, which has to do with how relational learning alters uh, the behavioral impact of events. You could just say, never mind diffusion, but let's call it transformation of stimulus functions. And somebody say, oh, that's a middle level term. I say, well, wait a minute. Are you saying you don't yet know how transformation of stimulus function works? The answer would be, yes, that's right. Well, that's a basic science problem. That's an RFT problem. And we need that basic science about how transformation of stimulus functions work inside symbolic networks. And so rather than blow up, it's, we call it a reticulated model. The, a, the CBS model is not bottom up, it's reticulated. It means web-like, like a reticulated giraffe with the web structure on their skin. And so clinicians need constantly to be able to have language that helps them with their next client, but also speaking in ways that informs how do we get an even more high scope, high precision way of speaking, basic principles, but also basic principles that come back up and tell us what to do with the next client. And so by the community keeping in a conversation, if you come to the world conference, there's basic scientists, applied scientists, evolutionists, philosophers, biologists, social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, by keeping in community and not being too quick to saying, oh, what you're interested in is not important. Uh, let us all work together. But I agree, really, I think long run, RFT is more important than ACT. It's more, and more important, clinical RFT is probably where we'll end up. Uh, but we're not there now. Uh, if you read my book, you'll see, you'll see there's some advancements. There's other people with other voices. That turned into a long rant. I'm sorry. Maybe the, that means we don't have met. And speaking about uh, long time, uh, there are two questions waiting in the chat, and the third one that is mine. Uh, would you have some more time to, to answer them? Uh, yeah, if people want to dribble out, you can keep it on the uh, recording anyway. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I have a one o'clock. I think I have a one o'clock meeting. I'm actually looking. Yeah, so uh, I do have to prepare for it, but, but I could take ten minutes. All right. Uh, so one of the uh, questions. I know, by the way, people will be dribbling away. So let me just say thank you for coming to everybody who came. I hope I was able to serve you in some way. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how about work evidence on chronic problems like personality disorders? You know, the the data on personality disorders is growing, but it's small. Um, uh, you know. If you think of personality just as these relatively persistent patterns of behavior that go across time and situation, when you're dealing with some of the flexibility processes or inflexibility processes, you're dealing with things that can produce that kind of cross time and cross situation similarities. And so it's not surprising. I'll give you an example. Uh, if you take DBT, DBT is pretty good evidence-based method for a particular kind of access to personality disorder problems. Um, it's both moderated and mediated by psychological flexibility measures. Marsh has published some of those data. So we're fellow travelers. We're kind of working in the same area. But if you want randomized trials, there's a very small number, there's a few, of particular personality disorders. But I, I would say, uh, number one, the whole concept of personality disorders has the usual syndromal problem. It's saying too much based on too little. But it's a really good area to look at of these highly consistent patterns that are unhelpful. And we do have some indication the processes apply. The next step would be to really try to uh, work out which of these different procedures. So I'll give another example from DBT. Uh, Marsha has put in her stage two 
methods or DBT is put values. She doesn't like putting it in early on. People who carry that diagnosis of borderline personality disorder often are shamed by values conversations. Now there's some people in the ACT world who have written books even, uh, uh, there was one called Wise Choices or something out of Australia, who do put values in, but they put it in in a way that really avoids the shaming piece that can sometimes accidentally happen uh, with people when you raise what they really want to be about. So we're going to have to fit the flexibility processes to these different problem presentations. And, uh, but yet we have pretty good reason to believe that they do apply. Myself, the reason I'll tell you exactly the reason I haven't done a lot of work on personality disorders, it's because I'm afraid of Marsha. I've known Marsha before there was a DBT. That's how old our friendship is, before there was an act. And uh, so I've let her uh, do what she does. And if you know Marsha, you know you should be a little afraid. This is a very strong woman. So my wife is a DBT and act person, by the way. I'm saying it with a little smile, you know, she's, uh, she's done a lot of good for the world, but uh, I look to people like yourself, maybe. Let's work it out and see how it applies. The next question uh, is from Mario. And you said you wanted to... Uh... Okay, here I am. Hello, Steve. Hi, Mario. Uh, thank you for your time for sure. answering those questions. Uh, this is the, the question uh, that comes from top of my head, and uh, I, I might think it's true better, but uh, here is what I offer right now. Okay. I'm interested in uh, what do you think, uh, what would be uh, the, the transition path for, for the CBT therapists or uh, REBT therapists uh, uh, to model of models. Uh, yeah. And uh, 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 I, I come from the uh, ACT and RFT background, and I use it uh, every day in my practice for a couple years and uh, it is uh, easy for me to understand and to grasp those ideas and to uh, move through the model. Yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking about uh, my colleagues uh, that are uh, CBT or REBT yeah. oriented and uh, how would they do that? Uh, what they uh, have uh, uh, to, uh, 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 this is uh, not uh, put too well, but uh, how, what they yeah. need to, to, to remove <laughs> and what do they need to add to their uh, practice? Uh, I would say just add. Nothing needs to be removed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, I said uh, it was Here's what you'd need. Poorly put up. Uh, yeah, but I get the issue. And one reason I didn't give you the classic uh, hexagon, you notice. Yeah. I gave you this weird thing you may not have seen before, is because I deliberately wanted, thinking there are people in the audience who are more connected uh, to CBT to have something that was easily accessible to them. So here's the, here's the deal. Like, let's say you have somebody trained in a CBT model who really thinks cognitive reappraisal is very, very important. And maybe it trained as a Beckian, let's say. I'll, I'll get to the Ellisonian people in a second. And uh, they, they know that, uh, you know, uh, supposedly there was this war with Steve Hayes, but then they, they also noticed that some very good CBT people are taking it seriously, so now they're going to look. Well, I would say be guided by the evidence. Cognitive reappraisal as a process does predict positive outcomes. However, it's mediated by cognitive flexibility and by psychological flexibility. I can show you the longitudinal studies. Think about how this works. Let's say you're doing a thought record early on. And there's this weird thing that by session two, even in the classic Becky and depression, people sometimes start getting better. What's in those early sessions of one, two, or three? Learning to notice your thoughts, distancing, yeah, mm -hmm. so that you can work on it. Yeah, yeah. The first name for ACT was called comprehensive distancing. Mm -hmm. It sounded dissociative. We got rid of that name. I'm glad we did. But the reason was is that we were trained in these methods. I was trained in Beck and Ellis. I, you know, but we thought maybe just backing up and noticing your thoughts would allow you to have more behavioral and psychological flexibility. Well, what's the next thing in a traditional Beckian model? It might be behavioral homework. 
Oh, I can't do anything. Well, like what? I can't even make breakfast for my family. Okay, well, let's do a little experiment. Let's see if you can make breakfast for your family. And here's the thought record. So now you're looking at your thoughts. That's starting to sound like diffusion. This is kind yeah, of, yeah, who's yeah. looking. You're trying different behaviors. This is before yeah. I teach you how to think rationally or think differently. And we start seeing some unusual improvement. Well, behavioral variation and the presence of thoughts is at the very essence of what an act person want to do. So here's one thing I'd say to you as an act person. You can take the reappraisal methods your colleagues want to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. Use them, but use them to encourage cognitive flexibility. Yeah, yeah. Why would you do that? Well, you know, there's very little data that detecting, challenging, disputing, and changing mm -hmm. is the key element of CBT. Mm -hmm. You know those big meta-analyses where you pull out the cognitive components? Mm -hmm. Like the, the second study that, or second and third, well, the first and second both, but especially the second one that Neil Jacobson did, the dismantling study, yeah. where he was working with Keith Dobson and Keith and Steve Holland was literally calling up Tim Beck. So we've got the best CBT people on the planet. And for severe depressives, it was better to pull out the cognitive elements. So that tells you this is not the most powerful and at the level of processes of change. But it can work. There are studies when cognitive reappraisal works. When does it work? When it encourages cognitive flexibility. And by the way, that's in the early ACT protocols. So if you take like the 99 book on ACT, write down your story, circle all the emotions or thoughts, underline all the facts, now write it a different way. We're not yeah. telling people to find the true story of their life. Yeah. We're trying to get them to catch that they can take the facts and the reactions and language about it in a variety of ways. And so sometimes we'll have people write two, three, four different stories none of them is the right story. The point is to notice that your story ing. Well, that's very friendly in a way to a cognitive model. And so I would say, if we can get people interested in process, do a deeper dive of components linked to processes, and you begin to see that, no, it's not, I mean, this is why the, you know, the uh, classic uh, cognitive uh, uh, measures didn't do a good job of mediating outcomes. And uh, like we were, we added believability, for example, to the depressogenic depressive thoughts in uh, the one that um, uh, was developed early on in the CBT uh, world having to do with the depressed attitude checklist and things like that. So uh, we're colleagues, let's work together. Now for the REBT is easier because REBT has a radical acceptance core. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it also has A, B, C, D, and that D was disputation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you ever saw uh, Ellis liked ACT, and he liked RFT. He's on the back of the RFT book. He's written a blurb supporting it for RFT. He said it was wonderful. Uh, the, I'll give you just a quick story. I know I'm going late, but the reason why we started doing work with psychotic folks with chronic mental illness with ACT was I had a conversation with Al Ellis, and he couldn't say a sentence without cussing, so uh, forgive me for the cussing. But he said, hey, this is for goddamn eggheads, meaning ACT. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, God, you know, figuring out what's rational or irrational is a lot more eggheady than just singing your thoughts or whatever the crazy stuff act people would do. So we did that trial with uh, chronically mentally ill four hours in the yeah, inpatient yeah. in hospital. In 2002 and one. Yeah, yeah and it, it's 2002 and then it's been replicated so, several times. There's some, it's not a panacea, but there's something important there of helping people with hallucinations, especially delusions too, but that's harder to look at the hallucination rather than look from the hallucination. Um, uh, so I'm not, but, but a lot, there's a lot of REBT people who are in that community now. And so uh, there is a book called uh, Act for the CBT Practitioner. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Sorochi was the uh, editor or author. 
uh, published also by New Harbinger. And I think as we go in a process-based direction, you're going to see people mixing. Now, I had a pe person come to me and say, oh, gee, you're taking ACT away from me. PBT, please don't take it away. You know, like you said, you're going to hold on to the ACT mount. I say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because frankly, if we got on a process-based journey, let all flowers bloom unless the models that do the best job win. Mm -hmm. That's good for people. And I think our process model in the ACT CBS world works pretty darn well and will can be augmented by techniques and methods from classic CBT, but not okay. just that. I'll do empty chair work. I'll do family uh, uh, systems, uh, you know, internalized family systems work. You know, I'll do gestalt work. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Do I care yeah. about the brand name? I care about the methods moving the processes. Yeah. And uh, analytic work and mentalization stuff, that Peter Fodigy or something like that. So uh, let's get on the same page, tear down the walls, mm -hmm. but not in the silly way of, you know, everybody wins prizes. Yeah. You know, this is not la-la land. No, in a serious effort what are the most powerful simplest easiest set of processes that we can focus on that will do the most work with the most people and help give us the most guidance clinically of picking kernels and methods and uh, i'm confident that the act model and psychological flexibility will do very well in that world and if it's beat by somebody else great Great, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. More people are being helped. Why should I care about that? I mean, come on. We're not building monuments to dead people. I'm not going to live forever. You know, let's build processes to liberate people. Thank you very much. This will be helpful for my colleagues to hear. Uh, uh, I'm glad that it's recorded. recorded. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> yeah, I would say to your colleagues, let's get into community, open a yeah, conversation, yeah, yeah. try these things out, come to a workshop. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's not a cult. Your hair will not go on fire. <laughs> yeah. And then use what's useful. Leave the rest behind. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I guess we're coming to the end. Thank you so very much for taking your time to teach us. Well, thank you all for the time. I hope I've been uh, of use to you and the people that you serve. And I hope to see you on the circuit somewhere. Yeah. I know you're in far fung places and it's sometimes expensive to get, but. But maybe uh, in Dublin. If, if, if we get in the physical space, uh, say hi. Okay. And also thank Here you very friends. much for attending. Bye. Ciao.